Good morning, everybody. I'm presenting it to 3 a.m. my time, so excuse me as I try to wake up this morning. Um, my name is Heidi McDonald. I'm thrilled to be here uh, in Sweden again. I was here five years ago, and the folks graciously brought me back this year to give a slightly modified version of a talk that I gave earlier this year at GDC uh, at the Narrative Summit called Why We Care, the Narrative Burden in Creating Empathy. So I guess we'll just go. Now, a little bit about me. Uh, I came up in the game industry by working with Jesse Shell at Shell Games in Pittsburgh. I made nine titles with Shell Games as narrative person, writer, designer, uh, doing some systems and features work. I'm also the author of the recently released book about romance and sexuality in games, titled unsurprisingly, Digital Love, Romance and Sexuality in Games. <laughs> Um, I am currently the senior creative director for an organization called iThrive Games, which I'll tell you a little bit about here. I'm also known for wearing hats, but I'm not wearing any of my fancy hats today, but uh, some of you may have seen me walking around GDC with, with crazy hats on, and I do wear a lot of hats at iThrive where I work. Our mission of the organization is to empower teens to thrive with great games. and. Admittedly, that sounds kind of broad, so it's like, what, how do they go about that? Because that sounds like it's pretty huge. Um, there are a lot of different activities that we do, uh, any, anything from developer outreach to research and educator partnerships, and we have a lot of resources online, those kinds of things. This is where I live. Everything in that column, those are the things that I'm responsible for in my role as senior creative director. I oversee a number of game projects that, that we have with our partners, and I also do developer outreach and conference talks like this. So I do a whole lot of different things, but it's all related to engaging the community of game developers and university students who are studying game design, and I like it a lot. Now, don't worry. I am not in charge of science, okay? That is how you know that our outfit is legit, that they did not put me in charge of the science. Um, we do have some pretty smart folks, though, who are helping us out with the scientific part of our work. Uh, anyone from Harvard and Yale to UC Irvine, DigiPen, DePaul, uh, folks at Hevga, and I hope to build an important partnership here in Sweden as well to engage folks here in the kind of work that we do. Now. Some of these concepts that you see up here, lately, I don't, I don't know if this is also true in Europe, but it is very certainly true in the United States where I live right now. We're seeing a little bit of a shortage of concepts like this one in daily life. And so what we're trying to do is to figure out how do you teach these, how do you encourage these by using video games? And so a lot of the work we do is research around how to do that in a way that connects with science. And it's not just, well, here's what we think works. We base our work on actual neuroscience and actual social psychology. A lot of my work recently has centered around empathy last year and this year, and we're starting to move into working also with kindness. But today's talk is about empathy because that's your theme here is empathy. Um, you're seeing a lot of things in the news lately to suggest that video games cause terrible events in the news. The science does not bear that out at all. The science says that games can actually do good things for people. Games can actually increase empathy. And that's, that's not what we're hearing in the news, in the United States at least, but it is the truth that games can do good things for people. Now, there are a lot of games out there that are already doing great things without the benefit of our resources. And in those cases, I want to talk to those developers and find out about the process, see if there's anything we can borrow and bring it in to the resources that we use to teach people. And I don't know how many of you have played the games that, that are up here, but these are the ones that seem to surface over and over and over when we ask people about games that they find meaningful. Um, personally, when I played To the Moon, I was a, an obnoxious ball of snot which ha with how much crying I was doing. It was just not pretty at all um, because it resonated with me a lot. And these tend to be games that we hear from people resonated a lot. I talked to Lucas Pope about Papers, Please, and I said, well, you know, did you set out to make an empathy game? 
And he really didn't. He just kind of built the game on top of the mechanics and he saw something that he thought could be interesting and he leaned into it. But he built an empathy game without setting out to. It was kind of a happy accident. And I talked to the folks who made Edith Finch and they said the same thing. We just wanted to make the kind of game that we ourselves would want to play. Now, the kind of thing that we do at iThrive is, you know, we're teaching how to make, how to deliberately design for things like empathy. Um, Ian Schreiber, a friend of mine who's at Rochester Institute of Technology, he posited, you know, 15 years ago is when Raf Koster's book on flow came out, Theory of Fun, and that is now taught at game design schools all over the world as like a basic element of important design. It's like you want your players to achieve flow. And so Ian Schreiber said, what if 10 years from now, this stuff that we're working on right here is being taught in Game Design 101, not because it's good for you, but because it's just good game design. That's where I'm hoping to see this go. I'm hoping to see people consider what makes a game meaningful, what makes a game resonate with people, create empathy, and hopefully that will go on to, to be taught in game classes. Now, just so I could have three slides in a row with quotes from guys named Ian, I, I just stuck this one up here too with my very favorite Ian in it. Um, and, and yes, I do suck at Cuphead, but I love it anyway. But we do care a lot about these games, but why? What is it about these games that, that, that get to us, that grab our hearts, that make us cry? What is it about these games that does that? Well, from a neuroscientifical perspective, the part of our brain that controls that function is called the right supermarginal gyrus. And that's, that's a lot to remember, so I created a mnemonic device for myself to remember what that is. I realize that it's pronounced hero, but it helps me nonetheless. But the parietal lobe of the brain, can, it interprets language and signals. And the frontal lobe controls personality, behavior, emotions, judgment, speaking, writing, intelligence, and self-awareness. So working together, these two parts of your brain, that's where empathy is created in your brain in terms of neuroscience. Now, the other part, which is the social psychology, there are components in social psychology that go along with what are the steps that are necessary in psychology to create empathy. Here's what those are, and I'll go through them. If you want to make an empathy game and you say to me, hey Heidi, how, how do I do this? How do I design for empathy? I could assemble the top 25 studies in neuroscience and social psychology and hand them to you and say, here you go, here's what the science says, and then expect you to read through them yourself and know what you're supposed to do with them. And you might just be blinded with science because I can give you the science, but that doesn't help you know what you're supposed to do with it and how it applies to game design. And that's what my job is. I try to take the science that's out there and translate into something legitimate that, that game developers can actually use and apply. Um, the process that I go through to get to my resources is we do a literature review, we boil the literature down to what are the most important current findings in neuroscience and social psychology, and what I do is I have a think tank where I invite top people in the games industry, experts all, to a resort, and we sit there and we crunch for days on what games exemplify empathy? And we sit there and we, we make a big list and then we argue about which games belong there and which games don't. And when we have a list that everybody is proud of, then we deconstruct it further and why does each one of these games belong on this list? And what we are left with is kind of a design recipe of features, systems, and qualities of a game that we believe will engender empathy. We also come up with a list of things about a game that we think might take away from empathy. So that's how our resources come about. And you know, like I said, we do that at Design Hives and, and those are a lot of work but they're also a lot of fun and if you're very lucky, Colleen Macklin will make you guacamole. <laughs> Our resources are all freely available at this website. I'll put that up again later at iThriveGames.org. But anybody who wants to see what our design kits are for, you know, designing for empathy or kindness or optimism or any of the, any of the concepts that we have kits for so far, you can get them on our website. So 
I just threw this slide up there again as a transition because it makes me happy to look at. <laughs> Back to the components of empathy. Uh, there are six things that psychologically have to, have to be in place for empathy to take hold. One of them is emotional regulation, right? And I don't know how many of you have seen Markiplier freaking out about getting over it, but the, the poor guy has no emotional regulation whatsoever when he's playing that game. <laughs> Emotional regulation can be as simple as choosing a dialogue option which is the nicer option or the not nicer option. Giving people a chance to experiment with different personalities because in some of the Bioware games, right, you can be the heroic boy scout or you can be the, the evil malevolent person or you can be the, you know, the quippy smart ass. That one's always my favorite. But that's, that's kind of an, you get to practice emotional regulation when you're doing that, and that's one of the components of empathy. Perspective taking is another important thing with empathy, and there are three ways that I've seen this present in games. One of them is through mechanics. Brothers, A Tale of Two Sons actually shifts between camera views of the brothers. You see the world in a totally different way depending on which brother you're playing as. And I saw a couple games out here that, that do that too. You get to see the world in a completely different way depending on what character you're, you're playing as. Then there's also ones that present both with mechanics and story, like 1979 Revolution. You have a camera and you're responsible to take pictures of what's going on and you have a whole scene in front of you and you have to decide what in that scene is important for you to take a picture of, and then when you choose what's most important, you choose what to focus on, specifically within that area, knowing that depending on what you focus on, your picture is going to be more important to this set of people or that set of people, and you have to make those choices deliberately, and it's really kind of interesting. And then perspective taking shows up in the story with detective games, right? It's like this crime has happened, and you have to go, and you have to get everyone's perspective on what has happened here and then based on everybody's different point of view of what happened, that's how you figure out the actual story because everybody has a slightly different piece of that story. Empathic accuracy. Now those who know me very well know that I cannot get through a presentation without having a slide of Alistair from Dragon Age because I love him. Um, this picture is actually an example of something called empathic accuracy, which is how well can you predict the way a person or a character is going to feel. Now, if you've played through Dragon Age Origins, you know that Loghain, who's, who's the bad guy, has betrayed Alistair very, very, very badly, right? And so you hear Alistair talking the whole time about how much this betrayal hurt him and how evil this guy Loghain is. So when you get to a point in the game where you get to choose, are you gonna execute the, the bad guy or are you gonna let him live? It's pretty obvious to you how Alistair is gonna react if you decide to let the villain live because he's been saying the whole time, you know, this is how his actions have affected me. So it's not too hard to predict that you're going to really upset Alistair if you let the villain live. That's an example of empathic accuracy predicting how another character or another person is going to feel about something. Then there's empathic contagion. Uh, this, this photo is taken from a movie from the 80s called Stand By Me, and uh, Will Wheaton's character tells a story about a pie-eating contest where the, the champion of the pie-eating contest throws up in a manner so, so dramatic that it makes everybody else throw up too. It's like as soon as this person sees him throw up, they throw up, and then the fat lady throws up in her purse, and everybody just throws up because seeing that person throw up also made them throw up. It's kind of like that. Here in Mass Effect, this is a scene where Thane dies. You see that they have blue lighting, which is kind of sad, and then you have the character standing over Thane with the head bowed. You can tell that that character is sad. That's an example of, of contagion, right? It's like the music is sad, the lighting is sad, the other characters are reacting in a way that's sad, so it's a lot easier for you yourself to feel sad because the environment is, is all cooperating together to help you feel sad and help you kind of get that contagion. Another example that is Telltale's Game of Thrones. The first time you see Lord Whitehall ride up, you know that he is a bad, bad man. 
And he hasn't said a single word. He hasn't done a single thing that you're aware of, but you have heard the people around you talk about what a horrible person this is. And so because you've heard the other characters around you talk about how awful he is, you already know that you hate this guy when he rolls up like this, right? Um, that's contagion. You, you catch on to what all the other characters think and feel about this character. Then there's perspective engagement. Am I going to take the time to find out about your backstory? Am I going to care about your backstory? I don't know about any of you, but I am exactly that nerdy player that will read every single book in a game, every single plaque on a statue, just because I'm interested in it. And, and there's some other game writer out there who had to spend time writing that stuff. So I read everything. That's perspective engagement, caring about what's going on behind what I can see, what's the, what's the lore here, what's the history. Now, Doris, who is going to be talking right after, right after I am, I love her to death, hello. <laughs> um, Doris did a really important study for us, for iThrive, with her students. And the question that she asked was, what makes a game meaningful? And she came up with some pretty interesting results. And I call these co-authorship versus authorship. Uh, co-authorship means that you give your players only enough tools for them to create their own experience. So you author the tools, you author the basics of the story, but then it's the players who get to de make little decisions that add up to their own unique experience. So in a way, that's co-authorship. Whereas authorship imposes a lot of structure. You're playing through a story without a whole lot of choice attached to it. There's a lot of enemy and conflict, and there's busy work. These two things tend to be what decides whether a game is meaningful or not. Because what her students found is that the, everything in the co-authorship column was what helped people feel that the game was meaningful to them. Now, going back to Edith Finch, when I spoke to the Edith Finch people, their playtesters found something very interesting, and that was that it wasn't the huge decisions in the game that were meaningful to players, it was the little ones. You know, what to put into a memory box, because you've got this memory box in front of you, and deciding what to put in the memory box, there's only so much that fits in the memory box. So you also have to decide what is being taken out of the memory box. So something, something as small as what to put in my memory box forces the player to really think about, oh, what, what things are important to me? And putting them in that moment where they have to reflect on the importance of their decisions and the different objects in the game, that is the type of decision that resonates more with players. Not the big ones, the little ones. That's what they found. Another one is concern for others. It gets a little bit dicier. This picture doesn't, because I want to hug a Pikachu too. But concern for others is where it gets a little bit more difficult, right? We, we developed something called a pyramid of feels. And your job as a narrative person and as a game designer is to get people from the bottom of the pyramid to as high towards the top as you can. Apathy, I don't care how you feel. Pity is, hey. Sucks to be you. Sympathy is feeling sorrow for someone else's misfortune, but not necessarily having a personal understanding of what it was like to go through that particular experience. Empathy is, oh wow, you know, something very similar happened to me, so I, I feel how you feel right now. And then compassion is where it gets put into action. Now, kindness is also empathy put into action. And you'll notice here, you know, I'm doing, starting right now to do a lot more work around kindness. We have found that empathy is actually one of the components of kindness because understanding, you know, these are the psychological steps that you have to go through to get to kindness. And you'll notice that empathy is the second step. It's understanding. There can be empathy without kindness, but there cannot be kindness without empathy is what we've found out because kindness is the action. One, th one thing that we see designers kind of not necessarily getting right all the time is the difference between empathy and sympathy. Like I said before, it's understanding what the person's going through because you, 
you have an understanding of their circumstance versus knowing exactly how they feel because you've been through something like that yourself. It's the difference between laughing with someone and laughing at someone. Uh, empathy is acknowledging both your own and another person's emotion. Sympathy is suppress your own and other people's feelings. Empathy is I can understand how it feels and that must be really hard. Sympathy is oh, poor you. Now, there are two parts to empathy. You've got, remember I said the social psychology side, which is the affective and the feeling side, and then you've got the neuroscience side, which is the cognitive and the thinking side. Those are the two parts of empathy that those six qualities that I mentioned before that have to exist for empathy to take root, they live within either the cognitive or the affective. And when the cognitive and the affective cross over, you get something called the empathy power zone. And you want to be in the empathy power zone because that is what helps to create empathy for people because you understand others and it helps you to connect and recognize people's experiences. And again, taking action is not required for empathy. Now, there are, <laughs> there are a few examples of what happens when your cognitive side works, but your affective doesn't, or your affective side works and your cognitive doesn't. Like for example, you've got Hannibal Lecter who understands empathy very well, he just doesn't care. <laughs> he wants to eat you. Um, you've got Eric Cartman from South Park who doesn't understand empathy and he doesn't feel it or practice it toward other people, he's just a jerk. Um, then you've got SpongeBob, who, who really, really, really feels for you, but has no self-awareness whatsoever, doesn't understand the cognitive side, so he will go way too far to, um, to try to help you or to try to, to feel with you, but there's no self-awareness behind it. And then you've got somebody like Malala Yousefi, who's got all of it going on. She both understands cognitively the role that empathy plays, and she also can feel with her heart what other people have gone through. Now, I want to take a slight detour to talk about trauma. Um, you saw the six psychological things that have to take place in order for a person to feel empathy. One of those things was not trauma. And what I seem to see every once in a while is that a game developer thinks that in order to have people understand and be aware of a certain thing, you have to put the player through something traumatic to make them understand. For example, I'm going to make a game about anxiety and understanding anxiety, and in order to do that, I'm going to force you to have an anxiety attack. I don't think that's the right way to go about it at all, because trauma is not required for empathy. So all you're really doing is torturing your players. Don't do that. Don't do that. There's better ways to go about it. Now, when you're thinking about stories and how to bring them across, the personal is universal and the universal personal. So you have to go inside yourself and, and find the emotions within yourself and figure out how do you infuse your work with that. Now again, remember I said at the beginning how I cried really hard about To the Moon and when I was preparing for this talk, I tried to think really hard about, you know, I tried to process that, you know, why did I cry? I mean, this is a game, why did I cry that hard? And when I thought about it, I realized that it was because it was something that was incredibly personal to me. Um, I have another son whose picture you didn't see earlier. Uh, he has autism. And I care with it, so I care with a person with autism. And in this game, the developers have never explicitly said that it's about autism, but anyone who's familiar with autism will recognize that the character of River more than likely has autism because of her behavior. And what you see throughout this whole game is that Johnny is her caretaker and he has these challenges taking care of her and you know things in his life that he had to give up in order to take care of her. And there are times when she's being very challenging and, and he's very frustrated, but he takes care of her anyway because he loves her and she needs it. At the end of To the Moon, you have this situation where you make a different choice for Johnny, and that means that all the choices he made up until then go away. And so you have to watch every single moment that you've lived between Johnny and River, you have to watch River disappear out of the picture. Watching that for me was like 
looking at every family photo I've had over the last 20 years and watching my son disappear from them. That's how that felt for me, because you realize that no matter how frustrated you are caring for a person with autism, that you wouldn't have it any other way. You would not want your life without that person in it. And so it was that moment, that realization, that deeply personal thing for me in my life that connected with me and made me cry. Universal themes imply ideas about the human nature and the relationship of human beings to themselves, each other, and the universe. The Texas Association for the Gifted and Talented came up with these things as being experiences that are universal to the human experience. They believe that no matter what culture you come from, no matter what your socioeconomic circumstances, every human being can relate to these nine things. And then San Diego State University took it a little bit further and they came up with common themes in a story, which can all be filed into these nine concepts, kind of like a filing cabinet, right? Um, like you see, the, you see mothering, for example, over here, right? We've all had a mother biologically. Maybe we knew her, maybe we didn't. Maybe we are a mother, maybe we're not. Um, maybe we didn't know our mother. Maybe we have an adopted mother. Maybe somebody else in our family besides our mother functions as our mother. But basically, the concept of mothering or having a mother is something that we can all agree with. Now, it depends on your individual experience of mothering as to which of these nine concepts you are personally going to file mothering under. Um, some of you might file that under conflict. Some of you might file that under relationships. I had three children, so I might file it under change because that was an awful lot of diapers <laughs> that I went through. Um, but, but, you know, mothering is universal to all of us, and so are all of those concepts over there. So you can take common themes from stories and break them down to which universal concepts they express. And that's maybe how you can start getting to empathy. And something else I would say is, you know, this is, this is a shot of Clementine from The Walking Dead, Telltale, and they do some really, really heart-wrenching things in there about loss. But loss does not always have to be death, right? Loss can be loss of a job, which is your economic security, or it can be uh, loss of your health, you know, get, getting sick. It doesn't always have to be death or loss of a person. Loss can be expressed in many different ways. Oh my God. So you mean this lady just stood up here and talked for half an hour just to tell us to look inside of our own hearts. Really? You bet your ass I did. What I want to challenge each and every person in here to do is to go inside of themselves. Be brave, be fearless, because it is finding the joy, finding the love, finding the sadness, finding the emotions that make us human and expressing those bravely and fearlessly that is going to help other people connect with your work. Because the universal is personal and the personal is universal. Uh, once again, if you want to see our resources, they're at ithrivegames.org. And thank you. I will take questions. So thank you so much for the talk, Heidi. Okay. Um, so we have a microphone here for people who want to come down and to ask questions, of course. And uh, I can already start with one for you guys to make up your minds of what you want to ask. Um, you mentioned that it would maybe not be the best idea ever to put your players through trauma. And then you went on explaining and showing some of these examples. Like, I also cried when I sacrificed my life to save Clementine in, in The Walking Dead. Or um, in similar ways, Matt got by, by virtue of being a father access uh, in a different way to these kind of emotions and uh, experiences in games. But oftentimes, it felt like there was some recreation of trauma for me in order to get that understanding, to get to that point. Um, Into the Moon, for example, the experience that you recounted seemed to be nearly traumatic. Mm -hmm. So where do you mean that we shouldn't recreate it if it's, on the other hand, seemingly 
a tool that is used even in the positive examples you bring up. Okay, the question was, what is the difference between putting players through trauma and putting in, putting in sadness that will make you feel? Yes, I think exactly. that's a very good question, and we're still trying to figure that out, actually, where that line is, because um, I think the line is going to be different in every case for every person. Um, not everybody is going to be okay with experiencing an anxiety attack. Um, to, not everybody cried at To the Moon. Not everybody got, got as, as uh, emotionally involved as you did playing that game. And I think it's a very individualized thing. And so it's hard to be able to say, you know, this is the blanket. That, the, the one blanket thing that I think I can say is please don't put people through an anxiety attack. Please don't, you know, do not say that I'm going to put you in a, in a specific um, state of psychological crisis. I think there's a difference between feeling sad and psychological crisis. That's, I think that's where the line is. Um, that is a good question to ask our scientists because we have a lot of, uh, I'm the game person on a team of scientists um, and they are the ones who are the content experts with psychology who, who try to kind of nuance those things. There's an article that uh, one of our clinicians put up uh, about some tropes that need to die in games as far as mental health are concerned, I would say look that up because she does touch on those a little bit. You know, what is okay and what is not okay in terms of representing mental health. Thank you. Emily. Hi. Um, so um, I work with competitive games primarily and organization and meta organization of those games. Mm -hmm. And I think it's interesting that you say that empathy is not a thing that number-based gameplay can bring because it's so, like, when I see someone playing a game for 16 hours for a tournament and then they lose that tournament, like, the entire team or the people they play with become empathetic of the person. So it's like, where do you draw the line there? Like, the, these games still create empathy and it was very, Interesting to see you draw that distinction. Uh, <laughs> uh, see you draw that distinction in the middle of the talk. So I was like, so when you're creating, are we not talking about meta, like meta gameplay here? Because that was like one of the things that I thought was weird here. That that's a very good question. The question had to do with uh, different types of games like Overwatch or Dota are those games not capable of creating empathy? Uh, you're talking more of a meta kind of situation. I see what you mean. I was talking mostly about how to create empathy between the player and the game. What I think you're talking about is cases where multiplayer games are ones that can develop empathy between the players and each other on a team. And I do think that that's important, and I think that there are ways that can exist. For example, if you are playing Overwatch with somebody and somebody screws up and does something that gets you, gets everybody killed really, really heinously, then in order to go on to the next round, everybody has to forgive that person their mistake for, for the team to still function the way that it needs to in order to be successful. And I think in order for the team to forgive that one person. They, they have to be like, oh, you know what? I've made, it, I've made a mistake in a round before. I feel really sorry about that. I know how it feels to be you, so we'll just let this one slide and we'll do better next time. I do think that those kind of relationships exist. Um, and I do think that they're important to study. It's just this particular talk I was focusing on because it was given at the Narrative Summit towards writers who were trying to create cool. a specific, specific experience between the player and the game, but I do agree with you that it can also take place between player and player. Um, just a quick follow-up question to that mm -hmm. one. Do you think it's possible to create a player-to-game um, empathetic connection in a competitive game? Like, would that be possible, or is it like too far stretched out? I'm not sure about that. We would need to study it. Um, the, the question was, can there be a relationship between the player and the game empathically in a competitive game? I don't know. That's something worth studying. Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you for your talk, Heidi. I had one question regarding empathy as an aesthetic goal for games. Mm -hmm. 
and uh, specifically, of course, as designers, we are always uh, told and we are aiming toward creating emotion for our players. However, both uh, industry insiders as well as our teachers always say, do not start your game with a story because then you're going to overcomplicate the mechanics, but rather have it arise from the mechanics if possible. So in the case of uh, your talk now, if we were to target a specific type of empathy or a specific experience, would you rather recommend that we start with that as a narrative goal or rather as the aesthetic that we thrive towards in terms of gameplay in order to elicit that? I think that's also a very good question. The question was um, how often in the games industry people are encouraged to worry about the design pillars first and then lay the story down later and uh, he wants to know if you want to create empathy, do we need to kind of walk back from that a little bit and include story earlier? And my opinion is absolutely, absolutely yes. Um, I would personally say bring in the narrative designer even from the very beginning um, so that they're working in tandem, right? If you look at Papers, Please, if you look at 1979 Revolution, these are games that the story and the, des and the mechanics worked well together from the very beginning. And I don't believe in either of those cases was a case where they slapped the story down afterwards. You, know? um, you may have gone to an escape room before. Um, I did an escape room where the puzzles were, were amazing and were such that every single person on the team could feel like they contributed something because you've got a number puzzle and a word puzzle and a music puzzle and everybody can work together effectively but the story was awful. It was just cheesy and terrible. And I thought to myself, God, you know, how amazing would this experience have been if you had all of the compelling puzzles that worked together, but they'd brought in the narrative designer from the very beginning and the story was worked into the puzzles as well. I think it's possible, I think it's necessary, and I think a lot of the more meaningful games that we're seeing come out now are games that do that and do that very well. Um, I, I throw a lot of game jams all over the United States to test our resources out. You know, once we get these design recipes, I'll go to a university and I'll have a game jam so that people can practice with things and I can see how designers are putting these into practice. And what I can say after a year and a half of flying all over the United States doing game jams at universities is that there's a new breed of game developers coming up. And it's really, really incredible to see. Um, when I started in the industry, you know, seven, eight years ago, it was people wanting to make the kind of games that they love. But what I'm starting to see now is people who want to make important experiences for the world and for other people. And I think that's a huge leap. And I think that part of the key to doing that is marrying the story and the design a lot earlier in the process. Thank you very much, Heidi. Thank you very much for the talk. Uh, I, uh, my question is uh, similar to Timothy's, or at least plays into it. And uh, it goes into um, when we are developing games, uh, I have felt that we usually become very blind to the experience we create ourselves. Mm -hmm. uh, so I was wondering if you have any good tips on how to user test empathy, or how the connection to, between players and the characters in your game can be tested. Um, the question was, how do you user test for empathy? Uh, the studies that we do, we give them a psychological, there are psychological questionnaires that you, like if a person is going into a psychological hospital or something like that, they will ask you a series of questions and then you'll, they will rate you one to five on all of these different things. Well, they have a couple of those for empathy. And so what we can do is we can give people an empathy scale prior to doing, prior to playing the game, and then we can administer it again after they've played the game and see if there's any difference. There are also ways, uh, more t highly technological ways that I'm noticing where, uh, they can use facial expressions now. They, they can map your facial expressions and tell what you're feeling from your facial expression. Um, I don't have the budget to test that way, but it would be really cool if I did. Um, an another thing is we can videotape the player as they play through and have them kind of narrate their experience as they're going through and talk about how they feel at each juncture. Uh, I know that BioWare does really interesting testing with their 
cutscenes, what they'll do is they'll say, here is the list of ways that we want our cutscene to land. Here are the list of emotions that we want our players to have. And then they'll bring in the they'll bring in a focus group, they'll play the cutscene for them, and then they will not only ask them about their feelings while watching this cutscene, but they'll also ask them about the depth of their feelings while they're watching the cutscene. And so that's how they are able to know you know, did this land in a way that was less intense than hoped, more intense than hoped? Do we need to dial it back a little bit? Do we need to make it more compelling? That's, that's how Bioware does it. Um, so there, there are a number of different ways that I think you could test it. Not all of them have a high price tag. I think it's just uh, talking enough with your play testers. Very interesting. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much uh, for the talk today. Uh, from the examples that you brought up and the games that you showed us, uh, they seem to be mostly single player games, or at least uh, games where just the player got to play with the game. I was wondering how empathy happens with maybe two or three players, like if there's a way for them to make an empathetic connection with the game and each other, or? Well, uh, the question was that a lot, of the, a lot of the examples I gave were single player games, and that's right. Um, it's, it's been easier to study the single player games for the studies that they do, but that's not to say that there aren't co-op games that do that too. I mean, I've seen a couple right out here uh, that some of you folks have made that, that do a decent job of that too. So I do think it's possible that you can build empathy between two people who are playing a game together because you're building something of a shared experience that you can both draw from later. And if you are both playing through this situation that's very sad, well, now you've got this shared sadness. Or if you are playing through something that's just something really silly and unexpected happens, well, now you've got this common point of reference that's, that's really kind of fun. And you, that can be like your own personal meme that you joke about for years and years. I do think it's possible to do that. Uh, we are looking to add games like that to our official curated list all the time. Um, Somebody, somebody else is in charge of the curated list because she is a clinician who's cross-qualified in games. Um, I'm the person who flies around and gives the talks and she's the one who evaluates whether a game meets our criteria for being an empathy game or not. So check out the curated list that we have on our website because we're adding to it all the time. Thank you so much. Sure. Um, I would have uh, one follow-up question re regarding the empathy part. And now we have talked a lot about how empathy could be the goal, and, but you also mentioned during your talk that a lot of the times Plea felt about with the characters was rather when, with the little choices. Mm -hmm. And out of my own experience, I also felt that most of the time I felt empathy when it was incidental rather than when I was told to be empathetic, where it was kind of hammered in which in my opinion had lessened the experience. Mm -hmm. And your, from your point of view, what are the merits of having empathy as the goal or as an incidental experience of the narrative that the player is going through? Uh, the question here was, should empathy be the goal explicitly or maybe not as, not as explicitly? Uh, I don't know. That's a really good question. I think that you know, Lucas Pope made an empathetic game, but he didn't say, I'm, I want the goal to be empathy. He just wanted the goal to be giving people a compelling experience. And so just based on what I, the work that I've done so far and the games that I've studied and the games that I'm seeing people make with our resources, I would say that making a compelling experience should be the goal and then the empathy will arrive by itself, if that, if that helps. <laughs> Perfect. Uh, then thank you for your questions and thank you for the very interesting answers. We will have a short break now. It would be great if we could be back in our seats quarter past for Doris talk about existential game design. And uh, one more time an applause for you, Heidi. Thank you. Thank you.